perfect. So, how are you today? I'm good. I just spent a lot of time exchanging emails with some upcoming shows I have, but um, it's been a pretty productive day. That's great. That's awesome. Well, before we start, uh, let's welcome Lexi to the show. Lexi, thank you so much for accepting. Now, before we start, I have to give you an epic welcome to the show. So, here we go. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> so, starting with the whole interview here, tell me, like, what made you wanted to move from Connecticut to LA to study theater? Well, um, living in Connecticut, I was actually closer to New York as far as big cities for the entertainment industry mm. go, but um, I knew that. I had done the, uh, musical theater for a lot of my childhood, and I was always a dancer, but I was never really like the lead singer, and I just decided I didn't want to be a chorus girl for the rest of my life, so um, mm. LA was a little more attractive to me as far as like the TV and film industry goes, and um, when I was applying to colleges um, looking for theater programs, um, I ended up getting into Loyola Marymount University. Um, which has a great theater program and is like right by the beach and looked very tropical to me coming from cool. Connecticut. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, cool. And then, so then you had uh, an abroad program and you mm -hmm. studied at the, Mos at the Moscow Art Theater in Russia and you performed also in Bonn, Germany. Now tell me about that experience and what are some of the best moments you had during that time? That was a dream come true. It was really awesome. Um, so it was a little weird because we started in Germany um, through my program and then we went to uh, Russia for a month. I think it was just the timing of the program in Russia. Um, but it was really great because LMU's theater program that I was in is a Bachelor of Arts program, which means it's a little bit um, less focused on one part of the theater instead you're studying every part right you're you're studying stage management and directing and set design and all that and i did really love set design at the time so i liked that but i didn't really know what i was missing until i got to germany and russia because especially in russia it's a um conservatory style mm. so it's very focused on acting all day long i mean we went from 8 a.m. to you know probably midnight we had classes in wow. movements and ballet and um, check off and all kinds of classes all day and then we would mm. go see theater around Russia at night which was crazy I mean it was in Russian right and I didn't speak Russian I only knew a little bit of it um, but especially because they focused so much on movement there there mm. were still a lot of performances that even though I didn't know the language you know I could still really really connect with them and, and that was awesome Um, and then back in Germany, we actually put on a play there, um, and that was a really cool experience to like, have a professional production up in Germany. Um, but aside from that, what I, what I loved about the program there is that in general in Europe, the theater is a little bit more um, avant-garde, it's a little more metaphorical, and um, so a little bit more like experimental, and so that was really cool to experience that side of the theater. Whereas American theater is a lot more like realistic, uh, like realistic fiction and that sort of thing, where it's even the theater is very close to film. So um, yeah, it was a great experience to have that. And my favorite class there was um, Eurythmics, which is a style of dance that um, basically they study the melody and harmony of the music as well. And they like adjust the movements to go against that. And we even like studied it from like a scientific perspective. So we like look, we studied the movements of like atoms under a microscope and then like made choreography based on that. Wow. Yeah, it was really cool. That's so cool. Wow. Wow. That, I mean, like such a very nice experience. I mean, yeah, that's very cool. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, and, I enjoyed the And from being in so many plays such as Christmas Carol, Women in Science, Tom Sawyer, Romeo and Juliet, What did you enjoy the most about doing uh, like those plays? So a lot of those plays um, are with a company that I worked with for years called Will and Company. Um, mm. And most of the productions I did were at um, schools. So it okay. sort of falls into this like edutainment as they call it. Um, and so the, the classics like Tom Sawyer, Romeo and Juliet, I did for elementary through high school age kids around Southern California. So you're kind of like a traveling theater. And um, for me, what was most rewarding about that was how much it meant to the kids, you know, like yeah. it, for things like Shakespeare and 
um, the Odyssey and that to really come to life for them so they get excited about it was really awesome. And I'll tell you my like the most meaningful story to me. Um, there was one season where we got a grant to bring um, the Christmas Carol to some schools that had um, some smaller budgets and couldn't normally have the arts at their school. And after one of the shows, um, a teacher brought up this first grader, a little six year old. Mm. And she said, um, his name is Angel and he, uh, had just gotten out of the hospital because he was on suicide watch, which at that time I didn't even know that someone that young could be on suicide watch. Yeah. And uh, she said, he wanted to come get your autograph. She said, this is the first time I've seen him laugh since he's been back at school. And that just like Ooh. broke my heart. And I was like, he can have my signature. He can have whatever he wants, like <laughs> bring him in. <laughs> so that, that type of stuff was really, really rewarding. Absolutely, and also like the vibe, right? I mean, when you're do when you're doing like a like a play on theater, like the vibe that's going on there, like uh, the yeah, like the the connection also, right? That you wanna that you wanna deliver to those who are watching. I mean, that's that's really amazing, though. It is, and also what's really cool about doing theater like that close up um, with yeah. kids of all ages is reali realizing how different each audience is. Like mm. the, an audience of first graders is very different than an audience of sixth graders, right? Yeah, like, really. and with the first graders, like if you do more big physical movements and jokes, like they really respond to that kind of comedy. Whereas uh, you have to be a little bit more like real and straightforward with the older kids. And so it's kind of fun to get to do the show over and over again, but it's different every time because the audience is different every time that's cool so so in so in certain way it keeps being like a new one right exactly it keeps that's it fresh so, that's so cool and tell me what do you like the most about your characters that you have played on those um i mean i played so many in there i would say um with juliet in romeo and juliet the most fun thing is how naive she is and so you get to sort of mm access that that like childish love you know inside of you and that sort of like naivete about the world and about about love um and so that was really fun um i played huckleberry finn for a while which was really fun to like get mm. to play a little boy and that one i just got to do whatever i mean i just because he's sort of like the town you know troublemaker so i got to like yeah. do whatever i want and i would like get huge laughs out of the kids you know just like sticking my tongue out at them or picking my nose to them you know like it was just really fun <laughs> and then um one of the shows that i actually took to universities um we did women in science during women's history month and i played mary walker who um is the only still to this day the only woman to ever earn the medal of honor she um was a doctor during the Civil War, and she um, really saved a lot of men's limbs because she like really used the tourniquet system. And basically, like at the time, it was common practice to just like chop someone's limb off if they had an, a wound. Um, mm -hmm. And so she kind of put an end to that for the most part. And uh, so it was really cool to play her. Um, just really a like feminist before her time. Um, mm. During the time of the Civil War, she like wore a top hat and pants, and <laughs> she was really cool. <laughs> oh, cool! Wow, and also kind of inspiring, right? Like the fact that she was doing that during that specific time. Totally, yeah. Like wow. the the original uh, feminist, and you know, didn't care what other people thought. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, what do you think it's important for actors to know when they're starting uh, doing plays? So I would say um, it's important to do your work, which sounds really simple, but I think especially actors, like it's the most fun is to work with the other actors, right? And mm. to get to be on stage and, and playing with them. But I would say, um, especially if you're in high stress situations or, um, you know, you have a lot of dialogue like in Shakespeare, um, If you do the hard work on your own, if you do the work beforehand, if you mm. you know really investigate your character, do your research, um, if you do, the more work you do beforehand, it, the more it frees you up to like play with your scene partners when you're actually in the moment in rehearsal and on stage. Mm. And like, 
you know, doing all that work also had, you have that to fall back on because especially in live theater, like anything can happen. Yeah, <laughs> so of course, of course. like anything can happen and you have to be ready for whatever's going to be thrown your way. So um, the more prepared you are, the more, you know, confidence it gives you and the more you're able to be freed up to, to have fun. Absolutely. Wow. And then like real quick here, what are some of the things that happened uh, to you when you were doing plays and you were like, oh crap. <laughs> oh gosh um <laughs> i mean i've had like set pieces fall down i've had um you know the fellow actor loses their place in the script and mm -hmm. so uh, you have to figure out a way to like save them you know yeah. <laughs> um i've had oh one of the funniest stories so because i used to take these shows to um to schools around the around the state um mm. some schools have nice big theaters right but some schools we were just doing it on their cafeteria floor and okay. so i'm laying dead as juliet like in the scene at the end when she's like you know fake dead mm. and there's like the kids are right in front of me they're like two feet from me yeah. and a couple of these like sixth grade boys like are, <laughs> are just saying to romeo like romeo's trying to go through his monologue and like he's supposed to be super emotional and there's these like two sixth grade boys that are going bro bro she's dead move on yeah. <laughs> and so we're just i'm trying so hard to keep it together and stay like i'm looking dead and not laugh and he's trying to get through his monologue and so you know stuff like that <laughs> that's so cool wow so many funny so, so many funny stories i bet you have that's so cool yeah <laughs> wow <laughs> now <laughs> so moving on after returning to uh, to LA because mm -hmm. of your film education you have been, you have been behind and in front of the camera on sets web series sketch comedy video shorts as well and short and feature films tell me what are some of the things you learned on the process of being involved in with like in so many things yeah I mean I I was really glad that I did start to make my own work for a while. You know, I had the sketch group, so we were filming sketches and I wrote the web series and the short film. And that really, really helped me learn about film because one of the biggest differences between theater and film is, is how much of a character the camera itself is. Okay. And so, um, you know, one thing that, that you'll hear in like a theater class sometimes is it's called an auditorium because it's audio, right? Like you listen to theater, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. in film you're watching. Yeah. And so there's so much that's said on camera without words. So like just because you can zoom up right into somebody's face, you know, you can hear mm -hmm. an entire story just by looking at their emotion on their face. And same thing in comedy too, is that, um, when you're writing a sketch comedy, like something as simple as like a quick pan of the camera or a quick cut in editing um, can be a joke in and of itself, right? That can yeah. get a laugh. Um, so it was really learning how to say less and let the camera do more work. Mm. And um, so that was, that was a big learning curve when I was learning to write for the camera. Um, and, and then also just there's so many moving parts in film and, um, It's, it, I mean, every actor has a different, like some people love theater, some people love film uh, for different reasons, but sometimes it can be harder in film to be in the moment when there's like a camera in your face and somebody holding a microphone, right? Yeah, I you know, yeah, it's I a little bet. harder to be emotional in that moment. So um, it was good to learn all of that on like smaller scale projects before I got into, you know, bigger projects. Yeah, of course. Wow. Yeah. Then you wrote and produced and start a short film called Uphill, which mm -hmm. it was accepted into the Real Recovery Film Festival as well as the Wayfair Film Festival in 2016. So tell me, how do you got inspired to write that short film? And what are some of the things that anyone could relate from Stella and Dominic? So I that actually came just from a desire to do something dramatic on camera because at the time, I was doing a lot of dramatic work in my acting classes, but mm -hmm. I hadn't um, done a lot on camera yet. I'd been doing mostly comedy. So I wanted yeah. to do something a little more dramatic. And my friend um, who I wrote that film with, um, he had a little bit more writing experience than I did. And so we sort of started just brainstorming together and he came up with like the general concept of it. 
and um, and then I took a stab at writing a lot of the dialogue. And um, once we came up with the concepts, what I found really cool about the screenwriting process for me was um, it's similar to acting in that I just have to get into the mindset of the character mm. and then the character tells me the story. So it's okay. almost like as like I get into the character, get into the situation and the scenario, and then I just think like, okay, like what as this character, what am I doing next? Mm. And that's kind of how I wrote what she did in that film is just like, okay, well, what would I do next as this person? Wow. And um, so that that was kind of cool because to me it was I've heard other writers say it's kind of like the characters speak to you, and that's kind of how I felt. And um, I had pulled on some of my own experience with depression um, to write it. Mm. And um, I think as far as what people can learn, you know, and relate to with the characters, what was really meaningful to me, um, two, two things happened. One, um, we hired this makeup artist who yeah. I just found from a makeup artist school. And she told me that she sent the script to her mom Okay. And her mom lived in, uh, I think she was Mormon and she lived in Utah. And her mom just was like raving about, about it and made her cry and she loved it. And she was like, we need to be telling stories like this about mental health. And yeah. so the makeup artist is telling me this and it's like bringing me to tears because I'm like, never in my you know, wildest dreams did I think that I'd be con like touching someone's heart who I'm just like a Mormon woman in Utah that I've never met, you know, yes. um, with this script. So, so that meant a lot. And then at the um, Real Recovery Festival, when we had the screening, um, a woman came up to me afterwards and said that she, for the first time, understood depression in a way that she hadn't before. Mm. And that really meant a lot to me. Um, I think, I think with um, with art. You know, we want to touch as many people as we can, but yeah. if you touch just one person, you feel like you've done your job. And so that meant a lot to me. Yeah, absolutely. Because one will become two, two, three, and, and eventually we'll, we'll be wow. And yeah. what do you like the most about uh, writing? Um, I think for me, it's therapeutic. I think it's, um, it's a way to um, express myself and express my sort of observations of the world, okay. Okay. Um, observations of myself, and just like how we act and react to the world as humans. Mm. Um, and it's specifically when writing scripts, um, being able to do that through a, a different character is kind of liberating because you, um, you almost have this like shield of the character. Mm. So, oh, cool. Yeah. So basically, like when you're writing, it's like an interview to yourself, let's say. Yeah, it can be. Um, and um, I, yeah, an interview and also just sort of like a um, like a reflection to yourself. Stream as well? of consciousness sometimes when you're you like thinking about you know your ob observations of the world that most people normally don't get to see, you know, yeah. or they can't see what you're thinking. And, and so then you're putting it on the page um, for the world to see. So it can be very vulnerable too, but I think, yeah, when you're writing to another, through the lens of a character, it gives you a little bit more confidence. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Now that same year, you start in Reasons to be Pretty and Reasons to be Happy. Can you tell me uh, like also about uh, like more, a little bit more about those projects? Yeah, so um, I actually produced those as well, and oh. um, it came from a director that I was working with a lot at the time. He and I were talking about that character, because I had been working on, um, I had done a scene from it for a showcase, and um, I really connected with the character of Steph from those plays, because she felt very different from me, in that she was, had no filter, she was less poised than I am and really mm -hmm. wears her emotions on her sleeves. And um, I was sort of inspired by that character in a way and I wanted to sort of explore that side of myself. Mm. Um, so also at that same time, um, Neil Labute, who wrote both of those plays, he was writing the third play in the trilogy. 
Mm-hmm. And so the third one was called Reasons to be Pretty Happy. Okay. And um, so like a month or two before we um, put up the plays, I actually flew out to New York and I saw a reading um, at the MCC Theater in New York of um, the third play. Mm. And they were supposed to go into production of it and Paul Rudd was in it and um, I'm blanking on who else was in it, but I got to talk to Paul Rudd after and um, it was a really cool experience. I was yeah. very excited and I was like planning on going to see the third one when, it, when they um, premiered it off Broadway the next year. Um, and so we thought it was kind of cool to do both plays um, at once to sort of gear up for the third play being released. Okay. Um, but unfortunately, I actually don't know all the details of the story, but I know that Neil LeBute acted inappropriately in some way and they decided to cut the play from the season at the MCC Theater. So yeah. um, it never it never got to have a debut. Um, Probably rightfully so. I'm sure he did something wrong. <laughs> I don't know, but um, yeah. So it was. Um, but anyway, the productions that we did were were very fun, and uh, and then somebody else actually picked it up and produced Reasons to Be Pretty again, the um, like a year and a half later. So we did. We re- relaunched it um, a couple years after. So that was cool. Wow. And then in 2018, you filmed the horror feature The New Hands. Now, was that the first time you were involved in a horror project? And can you tell me more about your character? So, um, it was actually the second horror film that I had done. Um, the first one was a short film by the same director. Um, okay. He had actually found me through um, another project that I did. A, a friend of his from film school had directed me in a project years prior. And, um, and he reached out to me when he saw it and said he wanted to work with me. And so we, I was in a short film that he did that was a teaser for a longer film. Mm-hmm. I'm not actually sure, I don't think he ever actually ended up making the feature length version of that one. Um, but a few years later, he asked me to come audition for this one. Um, and uh, the director's name is Brandon Scullion. Um, he's based out of Burbank. And um, he, so my character's name is Zora. And it hasn't fully been released yet, so I won't give too many details um, because they were in post-production for a really long time. And I think now they're doing the festival circuit before it has a full release. Uh, they told me we're probably going to have a premiere soon, but because of COVID, it keeps getting yeah, pushed back. Um, but anyway, um, my character is the girlfriend of the lead character. Um, and uh, basically, I'm have sort of like a fetish for hands and okay. then something happens to his hands um, in a chemical lab um, and and so that kind of breaks his heart and so he goes on a mission to try to fix his hands to win me back. Okay, that's, that's pretty <laughs> interesting though. Yeah. Cool, cool. And tell me, what do you think it's the key to make a good horror film? I think it's suspense. Um, I think you have to really build, uh, at least that's what I enjoy about about the watching a horror film is like the butterflies in your stomach, you know, yeah. when you're on the edge of your seat, you know, just waiting to scream. Um, but I also think that story is really important because if mm. you can, especially if you're writing like a lead character who's the villain, like you need to sort of get the audience to somehow to either fear the villain or yeah. somehow be rooting for the villain in a way that makes them uncomfortable you know <laughs> um so yeah i think story is just as important in horror as, as any other genre but suspense is what makes it fun and yeah, on absolutely. the acting side i just love all the like special effects and the makeup and the blood and all that kind of stuff is fun as an actor <laughs> yeah absolutely wow and yeah i agree the same thing i mean i think that the the, the suspense part is like the key Like mm-hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, I watched this movie called Babadook. And oh, it, yeah. It was, um, what happened was that a cousin, he was like, hey, uh, do you want to watch a movie? I was like, yeah. So I went to his house and he was like, hey, so do you want to order pizza? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, hey, I'll buy it. Okay, perfect. You want beer? And I was like, something is going on here, but okay, sure, I'll take it. So once we were ready, then he was like, by the way, uh, we want to watch this horror movie. And personally, I, I, I like it. But sometimes it's like too much. I'm like, no, wait. So I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just this movie, you know? It's not that bad. It's called Babadook. And I was like, okay. And then I was like, wait a minute. That was, that's the reason why you brought me here, right? Because you don't want to see it alone. 
It was like, yeah, basically. It was like, okay, let's watch it. And I mean, I love that movie because you didn't see yeah, it's just amazing. Like it's all like psychological and that was yeah, it was epic though. Yeah, the psychological element is what I really love too in those films. It's like it's like it, when it all comes together at the end. Yeah, and, yeah, it's, yeah, it's always fun. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, tell me about your run sketch comedy, The Sissy Space Girls, and the episode, The Seventh Stage of Traffic. Now, what did you enjoy the most about that sketch? <laughs> um, I love that you specifically singled out that sketch because it, it is one of my favorites and one of the ones I'm most proud of. Um, so I started doing um, sketch comedy more because I had done improv um, a little in high school, all throughout college. I was on my college improv team and um, I was in some comedy classes after college and part of me wanted to do sketch just because I'd already lo I loved SNL forever and yeah. then also um, because when all of your friends are actors and you're living in LA, it's like everybody has an improv show that they want you to come to. That's and I was so like, cool. well, instead of just like begging people to come to my shows all the time, if I make video sketches, all they have to do is like click a button and watch, right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, little did I know how much work that was all gonna be. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we learned so much. I mean, and that's what I really appreciate about that, you know, time of my life is just that how much we learned by doing all those sketches. Um, but seven stages of traffic, is somewhat based on a true story. <laughs> um, I was like driving, uh, I mean, if anybody who lives in LA knows how bad the traffic can be, and you know when to expect it, right? Like there's rush hours, there's different highways you avoid and all that stuff. But I remember coming home from a friend's house on a Sunday night when there shouldn't be any traffic. <laughs> Um, I was like trying to get home to spend some time with my boyfriend before the you know rest of the week started. Yeah. And I got stuck in like two hours of traffic. That's cool. And I just started to lose my mind. And so after I had to laugh at myself because of like how how strongly I reacted to like having yeah, to sit in yeah. traffic. And um, so I came up with that that sketch idea. And um, I was really glad my. Uh, friend Maria who was in the sketch group with me um, asked to direct it and she had some ideas to make it even better and um, so that and it was also one of the only ones that I was really like the only character in it uh, so that was kind of fun to just like uh, have have the spotlight on me for for that whole one so was, yeah now do you relate with some of the stages when there's traffic <laughs> Of course. <laughs> um, I don't know which, I mean, I feel like we all go through all seven stages at like, a, you know, at some level. Um, yeah. But I have definitely like screamed and hit my car and had a fit in my <laughs> in traffic before. Yeah. yeah. And what do you think is the usual stage everyone has when there's traffic? I think we all go through denial. I think we're just like, oh, it's, it's only going to last a little while. Yeah, like, as long yeah. as, once I get over this hill, I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. Uh, and then ultimately, we all have to get to acceptance because sometimes there's just no way out. <laughs> mm, yeah, true, true, true. And also, the, and also the, when you regret, like, oh, I should have, I should have go earlier instead of doing this. You know, that's, oh, yeah. that's so typical of me personally. <laughs> That's what totally. I would do always. Like, oh, I should have cut Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was really awesome. I mean, when I watched that, I was, I was, yeah, I was just laughing a lot because it was this is genius. Because yeah, I know a lot of people who would act kind of yeah, like who would act like exactly the same thing pretty much. That at some point it would be like, like, uh, like I'm hungry and searching for if there's an animal, I'm gonna eat it right now. You know. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, but yeah, it was really cool. Oh, I'm now, glad you did it. Now tell me about uh, not so grown up episode one battle. Where did you get the idea to create that? It's funny you ask about that one because I am not sure I remember how we came up with that one. I um, that's actually a fun story. I so that was actually my roommate for a while, Zara, and mm. um, that was actually a, we started that web series. It was my birthday present to her because we had been joking about a few ideas that we had and. So I just told her, okay, make sure you're free the day after your birthday. And like mm. the night of her birthday, I gave her a call sheet and had everything organized. And so we shot all three of the first episodes in one day um, mm. as her birthday present. And um, the first the first idea I remember coming up with was the um, 
sniff, uh, sniffing the markers episode. And that just came from because we both love the smell of Sharpies. <laughs> and I, I'm trying to remember how we came up with the battle one. And I, I'm sure it just came from like all of the noises that you make in your apartment, you know, that drive your roommate crazy. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just like, yeah, what could you possibly be doing in the other room that's making that sound, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also like, like whenever you are with someone next to who is just doing all those crunchy noises or something, and you're like, you gotta be kidding me. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it's so always the people you live with, right? Because like somebody else does it once, whatever, but it's like the people you live with who do it repeatedly and just start yeah. to drive you insane. <laughs> yeah, at some point you, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I relate to that, yeah, so. <laughs> now, can we expect to see more of your sketch comedy uh, in the future? Yeah, I hope so. Um, I took a step back from it a, for a while because I wanted to focus on some bigger projects. Um, and I just am really starting to miss it. So I definitely have um, a few ideas with a few friends that, that we like to make happen, um, including a few Zoom related ideas because we've all okay. been on Zoom for so long. So yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I do. I do hope to do some more in the future, um, but it's just it's tough to balance it with you know the bigger projects as well of course absolutely well and you also have an improv uh improv group called fan club now tell me about that group yeah um unfortunately the covid pandemic has pretty much put a put a stop to that for now mm. um but we we had grown out of um it was getting really exciting right before everything shut down because we had all just done all of the levels at uh, upright citizens brigade in los mm. angeles and that's where we met and um, we'd worked with a number of coaches and um, we were starting to do more and more shows and we had the idea to start our own show that we were going to invite other improv teams to and so i've always you know been a bit of a producer as well making my own so i was really excited about hosting a show and running that every week um, but then you know a bright citizens brigade mostly um, closed down and everything closed down because of the pandemic um, but I love improv and I'm sure as soon as things are much more open, um, I'll get back to it. So, um, oh, wow. yeah. Perfect. And tell me, what do you like the most about comedy? I think um, I like, I love making people laugh. I mean, that's that's always yeah. really satisfying, right? I mean, applause is really satisfying at the end of a play, but also like there's just nothing like the instant gratification of making mm. people laugh. Um, but also, it's a it's the most fun way to tell the truth <laughs> if that makes sense there you go uh-huh okay so okay. um yeah so like what's what makes us laugh a lot of the time um is because we relate to something right it's like why stand-up comedians are pointing out funny things that we do as humans or um yeah. so there's a lot of truth in comedy and it's like by adding the laughter to it, it sort of cushions the blow, right? So even if you're talking about something difficult or um, you know joking about something difficult, you do it in a way that like makes it easier to talk about. Um, there was one, there was one sketch that my uh, my best friend and one of my comedy partners um, in Sissy Space Cats uh, wrote called. Um, we ended up calling it twerking ruins everything um the original name of it was white guilt okay. and um it was you know it was about it was about racism and the way that like white people try to overcompensate and sometimes and um mm. it's so funny and so fun to make and um my friend danielle uh is african-american and she had like her unique spin on on relating to people like um white people who are like trying to overcompensate and so I what I love about stuff like that is that we can have a difficult conversation but do it in a fun funny way um, yeah. that sort of lightens the mood so that's that's one of my favorite mm. things about it so do you think that so you think that's the key for a good comedy I think in some ways yeah I think that um, mm. there's that I think also uh, you you can't have any shame going into comedy you have to be willing to yeah. be completely vulnerable to make a fool of yourself and um 
that's part of like the truth of it, right? Like some people think like mm. comedians are hiding behind comedy because they're making you smile all the time, right? Yeah. But I think really good comedy is like, you're also being extremely vulnerable with the audience and like making a fool of yourself in a way that puts them at ease. Um, so I think, I think that's some of the key is to, to leave the shame at the door. <laughs> Yeah, and you know it's funny when when uh, when when the comedian it's, it, it's telling like an embarrassing story, and then you and then you 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 start hearing from the audience like, yeah, I did the same thing. You're like, what? Totally. <laughs> like, <laughs> totally. Yeah, that's so funny though. Yeah, yeah, I do love I do love like uh, like jokes like that when they will tell you like an embarrassing story that you totally feel relate to, and you laugh because you're like, yeah, I did the same thing. You know, I've totally like, done yeah. that. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool thing. And tell me if you could make a movie or a play describing your describing your career at the moment, what would be the title for both? Oh, for for each? Yeah. I was I thinking of a few for this. Um, I think there's. Let's see. I, I think for the theater version of it, the play, it would be. Um, the calm before the storm. Okay, and that I sounds say that okay. because uh, a couple things. One, I think um, you know we're in a very stressful time in history right now, for sure. Mm. So it's weird almost to call that the calm, but it is in some ways it has paused a lot of the entertainment industry, yeah. um, and so there's that side of it. But also for me. Um, I have a few projects coming out, um, and I've had a few, you know, potentially, I, I don't know what's going to happen with them, but potentially big projects. And, um, so in this industry, things can snowball really fast. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, in my optimistic view of everything going well with those projects, mm. um, you know, this time in my life, even if it feels busy right now, it's nothing compared to how busy I'm going to be once once that stuff takes off. So, yeah, cool. the calm before the storm, and then uh, the movie version of it would be the forced break, which is uh, just that the this pandemic has forced me to take a break and reflect and uh, set myself yeah. up for success. I like those. Make sure to 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 save those so whenever you're gonna make for the next film you could use like like a title of that definitely i will <laughs> yeah sounds cool wow now i wonder like what keeps you more motivated to keep up doing really amazing things i mean besides acting you do painting building furniture tap gas skiing riding the bike with no hands and catching <laughs> your tongue to your elbow i mean what drives you <laughs> well that's just a fun thing i can do um <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I I think what drives me is I've always I've always been creative. I'm, I'm I've always been very curious, you know, as, yeah. a, as a child. Um, and as far as like doing the other artistic things, like I actually painted this mural behind me. Yeah, it looks cool. Thanks. Um, and I've started painting greeting cards this year and, and selling them. Um, and I've been doing woodworking for the past few years. I, I um, you, dance and theater used to be just like a stress relief for me. And um, when it became my career, when acting and all that became my career, there's a lot of stress around it and it becomes, even though I enjoy it, it still is work. Mm -hmm. And so I needed some creative outlets that were not work, that were just mm -hmm. fun and creative expression. And I could um, feel like I don't have to be good at them all the time. And so that's what painting started out as for me. Um, and then woodworking, um, I, before I went to college and before I decided to go into acting, I was either gonna be an architect or an actor. And um, in college and high school, I was in the wood shop a lot. I was like in the construction classes and I did set design and I built sets and stuff. And I really just missed being in the wood shop. It was like a really therapeutic art form for me. Um, and so I wanted to find a way to bring that back into my life and I actually found in LA, there's a wood shop um, called LA Wood Shop uh, where I took classes. And um, so it was just a really 
cool thing to do for myself every week that had nothing to do with the entertainment industry. Like I just needed something else. Yeah, of course. And so um, that, and you know, it sounds silly, but like a lot of woodworking is sanding. And so it's very repetitive. But so like, I just put my headphones in and that's my like meditation. That's so cool. Yeah, I mean, I think we all have to get, I mean, we all need like our, like, our activity, which is like our, our, our space to, mm -hmm. to uh, like fully relax, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think everybody needs a hobby in that way. Just go. something to, to take your mind off of things. There you go. But still, touching your tongue to your elbow, that's pretty epic though. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's my special That's skill. Pretty epic. I mean, you're like the first person I know who can do that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Someone told me it was impossible one once, and I was like, It is impossible. I, I mean, it so. is. It is super <laughs> impossible. I mean, it's funny though, because I can't do it on this arm. I can only do it on my left arm. I can't do any both. And you know, it's funny because one time, one time in my previous job, we were like so bored. So we started to be like, okay, let's try this. We were even betting like who could, like who couldn't won. Nobody won, of course, because it's impossible. So it's really epic. Though. Thank you. It's really epic. And tell me, uh, like any advice that you could give to someone who recently started on the active business or even someone who is following uh, like the dreams? Yeah, I think, um, The biggest advice and I would give is just to know that it's going to take a really long time yeah. and it's supposed to take a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever it is that you're working on or that you, you want to come true, um, even people who have success right away, often it fades and then they, then they still have to figure out the rest of it, right? Like how yeah. to have longevity yeah. um, in this career or, how to continue to keep their dream alive and how to like keep the passion. And then people who don't have success for a long time, you know, a lot of the times we see them as like, ah, oh, they're an overnight success. But you mm. don't see the years that have gone into getting to that point. Um, so I think knowing that it's going to take a long time and just getting comfortable with that, that like it's all part of the journey. And then um, it's also going to take a, um, an investment as well. Um, and like it's an investment in yourself, it's an investment in your dreams. But I think I was really hesitant when I was younger to spend a lot of money on it. Like there were certain mm. things that seemed like, well, I don't really need that. But yeah. the truth of the matter is you do, you need, you need the training, you need all the professional materials. Um, you know, if you're going into acting and you want to be on TV and film and you're living in a big market like New York or LA, um, it's the Olympics of acting, right? So like you have to have all of the materials and tools at your disposal to be able to compete at that level um so uh you know just being prepared to make the investment in it financially and with your time and uh and enjoy the journey because if you don't enjoy it along the way you know then, it, then it's just not worth it yeah absolutely yeah i think that is one of the reasons that maybe a lot of people will get disappointed or discouraged even that it takes a while You know, I mean, as you said, I mean, you might you might have success overnight, but even though you will still have a lot to learn in, in order to keep that line and not to go down again, you know, so right. yeah, I do believe that is one of the reasons why maybe a lot of people will be like, yeah, I'm not sure about it, you know, but at the same time, as you said, too, the rewards are amazing. Once you start, I mean, and even like small rewards, you know, but I think those like when you're when like when, when you're receiving that, it's one of the moments when you feel like like you're actually going on the right path. You know? Yeah. And I think, I mean, every dream is different, but for me, um, it's a tough career. And so I've had to ask yeah. myself at different points in my life, like, why am I doing this? Why do I love it? Do I still love it? And, um, you know, the, that answer has changed over time. You know, I think when I started, I think there was a little bit of it that just like thought like I could do this and it, Like, it would be fun to be famous or something like that. But as I learned more and more about it, um, and, I, and I had these little rewards of, you know, the mm. kids loving the shows and yeah. people relating to my films and all that sort of stuff, like, the, the answer changed where, like, I, it was, uh, at now it's not about any kind of fame or anything like that. For me, it's about, you know, the human connection of it. It's about... Yeah. Um, To me, acting and entertainment and all of that, it is a highly effective form of communication, right? It's using empathy to have a conversation. 
as opposed to debate or argument or you know trying to shove your ideas in somebody's face yeah. it's like let me show you a story that can help you relate to this point of view um or tell you you know tell you a story show you a story whatever whatever medium you're using whether it's stand up or film or whatever mm -hmm. but um and so to me that's what i'm really passionate about is like using the storytelling to communicate you know what i think is important at that time yeah absolutely wow yeah the connection is really important and you can tell sometimes right like with some with some films uh that that some films instantly you will feel like a, like there's a connection while you're watching it like and with others that it might take a while or maybe you won't have it at all but it also of course that depends on the person but the fact that you are kind of searching for that i think that is very inspiring and also really nice because most people uh they will only want they will only will will go for the money you know right. and at the end of the day that's important too as well but the fact that you want to have like uh yeah like more connection like to make it more uh, what's the word like uh, like more personal let's say that's mm -hmm. really that's really cool, that's really cool. yeah and, and even with comedy i think like like you said you know even that is a form of communication and connection because like i think that feeling that you're talking about when you say like oh i'm laughing because that's happened to me too you know That's, yeah. that's a way of telling people like you're not alone you know you're not the only one that's going through that or like, you, you don't have to feel stupid because i did it too you know it's mm. so uh, that's what i really love about it wow wow that's really epic and lexi thank you so much for being here on the show i mean i can tell that you are an amazing talented person and i really look forward for more for more of your awesome projects i hopefully we will see them soon and also yeah just keep up doing that amazing epic job because you are from i mean from sketch comedy which they're amazing from the films from all and, and all of the talents you have keep keep being that amazing person because definitely we need more talented people like you for sure thank you i appreciate that all right now before i send you off i need to send you off in an epic way so here we go again Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, so so yeah, so here we go again. There you go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and again, thank you so much. Uh, also, those who are watching this or listening it to the podcast later on, make sure that you're following Lexi and all of her social media. What I will do is, I mean, what I would suggest is for you to put pause here for a while, go follow her. Leave a lot of likes, then come back for sure. Uh, and again, Alexi, thank you so much. Keep having an amazing rest of the day, and I wish you an epic week. And I'll see you in the next one then. Thank you. You have a great day as well. Really okay, bye. Thank you.